Hi, this is Dr. Segel, and today I wanted to uh, demonstrate how I read an MRI of the brain. This is uh, this video is primarily focused for the first and second year radiology residents who are just beginning to uh, start looking at uh, MR brains. Um, and, and this is just my way of doing it. Uh, you know, you can figure out your own way of doing uh, or reading uh, an MRI of the brain. Uh, you can follow somebody else's way of doing uh, of reading uh, an MR of the brain doesn't matter, but I do recommend that you at some point uh, have a set format or set way of reading the MR, um, MR uh, reading an MR of the brain. It really helps, um, especially when you're in the reading room and if you get interrupted, uh, you know, so if you're looking, if you have a set way of looking at uh, certain sequences, it's always good. You follow the same sequence every time. Okay, so um, I usually look at uh, six uh, sequences in one screen and uh, you know you can again decide whichever way you like some attendings like to do it one sequence uh, one uh, one series in one um, in one screen some others like to do side by side only two sequ uh, two series some like four but I usually like six it gives me a good idea of uh, uh, you know it helps me compare different sequences um, in the, on the same screen and I, and I link all the sequences. So when I move one sequence, uh, you know, the others are moving as well. So, so let, let me show you how I do this. Uh, and um, I always start with the flare sequence and uh, some people like to start with the diffusion sequence, which is fine. Um, uh, either way is fine because I feel that the majority of uh, pathology can be uh, essentially figured out on these two sequences, the flare and the diffusion. And if you add the SWI or the susceptibility, susceptibility weighted sequence as well, you kind of uh, are able to pick up almost 80 to 90% of pathology in the brain. So once again, I started the flare sequence and one advice I wanted to give uh, you guys when you're starting off, please don't do this. I see this all the time being done by the residents. You want to look at this sequence very, very slowly. I look at every image, uh, particularly at your stage. Um, and you know, at this point, you, all you're trying to do at your stage is to figure out if something looks abnormal. You don't have to uh, kind of focus maybe too much, especially for the first years, like what that abnormality is. If you can f differentiate between abnormal and normal, I think you're I think that's that's pretty good. That's that's good enough. So in this case, you know, you're scrolling it, and I, and I like to scroll it two times uh, slowly. Again, not very fast. Slowly, I scroll it at least two times, and um, and you'll see that there is something clearly wrong. It is marked uh, on this image. There is some area of signal abnormality in the right uh, posterior temporal uh, cortex. We won't go over what this is uh, on today's um, lecture, but. Uh, clearly, there's something wrong here. Okay, so once I've done the flare, and again, I won't go over each part of what you have to look for. At least on this um, on this video, all I'm trying, uh, all you need to uh, figure out is if something looks abnormal to you. Usually, on flare sequence, usually since flare picks up water very well, uh, usually the pathology is bright on on a flare sequence. Okay. After the flare sequence, I do the diffusion sequence. Again, this can be interchanged. Some people like to do the diffusion first. Uh, diffusion, as you know, extremely good for acute pathology like infarcts, also good for other pathology, tumors, abscesses. Um, but, you know, um, mostly, at least in our setting, used primarily for infarcts. So it's very good to look for that. So again, you want to go slowly, you're looking for a uh, uh, an area which is bright on the diffusion sequence, which might indicate uh, restricted diffusion. Again, we won't go into, you know, restricted diffusion or T2 shine through and all that stuff. Right now, all you need to focus on is that something does not look right on this sequence or not. Um, again, this looks like a pretty normal diffusion sequence. After these two sequences, uh, I like to look at the SWI sequence, which is a susceptibility weighted sequence. Uh, some places, uh, in our campus, they do SWI sequence. Some places you'll see a GRE or a gradient echo sequence, which is uh, a similar kind of sequence, basically looking for blood products. 
can also help in evaluating for calcifications. Now, this is a sequence. If you do want to go fast in a sequence, this is a sequence you can go slightly faster when you're scrolling through because you're primarily looking for something which is dark. Like in this case here, you can clearly see there's something dark. Uh, we'll come back to this later on, but th this does not look right. Uh, it is uh, there is susceptibility noted in the right in the region of the right quadrant nucleus, which um, which I know that you know we did a CT scan. This ended up being a calcification, and again I, I won't go into why this is a calcification or why this is blood at uh, in this video. But basically, there is clearly a focus of abnormal signal on this SWI sequence in the right quadrant nucleus. And again, so I go through the entire uh, series here. It looks pretty good. Uh, besides that area which I mentioned. Now after this, I like to do the sagittal T1, uh, which I will pull out. Sagittal T1, again, uh, you want to, sagittal T1 is very good for midline structures. So I stop here for a few seconds in the right in the middle of the image. I look at the cella, I look at the stalk, I look at the posterior pituitary, I mean the anterior pituitary and the posterior pituitary. I look at the bone marrow here, the clivus, the upper C-spine. I look at the tonsils and make sure they're in the right position. I look at the corpus callosum as well. Uh, I'd see if I can find, sometimes you may, sometimes you may not, to try and see if you can see the cerebral aqueduct. And you want to make sure, you want to also look at the pineal region to make sure that there is nothing going on here. So that's primarily for the, uh, that's what I look at on the sagittal T1 sequence. After this, I look at the axial T1 sequence. And axial T1 sequence, in my opinion, is uh, more useful for trying to figure out something which you have already seen on the other sequences. Um, so, you know, like, the, like that area we had seen in the right posterior temporal lobe, if you're trying to find out what's going on with that region, you can use the axial T1 as a, uh, as a um, contributory sequence uh, to see if there's any signal here which might help uh, tell you what that lesion was in the right posterior temporal lobe. If you have a post-contrast sequence, then you want to look at the axial T1 and the post-contrast sequence together. So now I'm looking at the post-contrast sequence here. And you want to always make sure now this lesion here, which we had seen on the previous study, uh, previous um, sequence on the SWI sequence appears to show high T1 signal. You want to make sure that it is actually true enhancement or not, uh, not something which has an underlying T1 signal um, within it. In this case, clearly it looks like there's enhancement. You see the non-contrast, there is no high T1 signal. And on the post-contrast, there is high T1 signal suggesting that this is an enhancing lesion in the right caudate uh, nucleus. Again, I won't, um, I won't get into what this is, but basically that there is clearly some area of enhancement in the right caudate nucleus. There also appears to be another area of enhancement here in the right posterior temporal lobe in the previously noted lesion, which we had seen in the right posterior temporal lobe. And other than that, I don't see any other areas of enhancement. Okay, uh, that takes care of the post-contrast D1 sequence. Um, last but not the least, um, I look at the axial T2 sequence and there are several things I look at uh, on the axial T2 sequence. This is always the last sequence I look at. I start from the top and this is uh, in our setting, it is always done with fat saturation. So basically the bone marrow is dark because the fat has been uh, suppressed. So if there are any lesions in the bone marrow, this is a very good sequence to look at. So you're focused uh, on the bone marrow here, making sure that you don't see any um, bright lesions or hyperintense T2 lesions um, in the bone marrow. I don't see anything. All these foci of linear foci of high T2 signal, which you see in the bone marrow, they are continuous linear structures and, and uh, represent uh, vessels or, or veins. Uh, as you come down, I focus on the globes. That's number two, globes, optic nerves, make sure they, are, they grossly at least look fine. Then look at the flow voids, extremely important uh, to make sure there is no major or large aneurysm sitting somewhere here. I mean, if there's an aneurysm, you know, it'll sh appear as a, a prominent flow void. You want to make sure that there's no obvious occlusion or stenosis in this vessel. If there's a severe stenosis, one of these flow voids will appear smaller than the other. And you want to take it down to the cavernous uh, supraclinoid here. Uh, cavernous carotids looks fine. Uh, right down to the Peter's carotid. Same thing in the posterior circulation, both words. Uh, basilar artery looks pretty good. Uh, 
and then a little bit of the PC as well, you can see here and here. So just, it, this is not obviously a sequence to evaluate for evaluate vessels, but generally just to get an idea, if there's any major abnormality, um, it may be seen on this t 2 weighted sequence. After that, I come down further, look at the paranasal sinuses. You want to look at all the sinuses, frontals, ethmoids, maxillary, there's a small likely retention cyst or polyp sitting here. You want to make sure you look at the mastoids and the sphenoid sinuses. Coming down further, always look at the IACs. Uh, again, you know, you can look at the IACs on any other sequence as well, but I always like to look at it on this sequence because it is a T2 weighted sequence. And if there's any, by chance, any incidental mass in the IAC, uh, this would be a good uh, sequence to look at the IAC. And plus, uh, you know, it reminds me that I need to look at the IAC every time. That's one way to remember that I have taken uh, I have taken a, a look at the IACs. Then I look at the um, at the nasopharynx, uh, make sure there's no obvious mass there. And last but not the least, I look at the parotid glands. So several things, I'm, I'm going to go over it again, at least seven or eight things you want to look at on the axial T2-weighted sequence. Bone marrow, come down, globes, optic nerves, flow voids, ISCs, paranasal sinuses, nasopharynx, and the parotid glands. And uh, that kind of, I think that uh, concludes, uh, you know, a pretty simple, just wanted to show you a simple, my method of uh, looking at an MRI of the brain. Thank you.